the dream time, when the world was young, the Yilunji people lived in the beautiful wild country of Cape York. They were hunters, the men spearing kangaroo and emu for meat, or catching fish, tortoises and crocodiles in a stream. The women and children gathered yams, fruit and honey. The walls of their caves were decorated with ochre paintings of animals, plants and people, illustrating the stories handed down to each generation. These stories told the tribal laws, taught the children how to behave, as well as warning about the Quinkins, those sometimes good, but nearly always bad spirits who roam the wild bushland. The good Quinkins, called Tamara, were very tall and thin. The evil Injun was short and fat. They bounced about on knobbed tails and stole children. But most dangerous of all was Taramali the giant, whose name meant thunder. Hello, I'm Kylie Belling, and I'm here to find out about the people who put these paintings here, and also about the stories the paintings tell. That's a Tamara Quinkin. Strange, isn't he? Quinkins play a very important role in a lot of Aboriginal stories. I wanted to find out more about them, so I read some books written by Percy Trezise, that's him over there, and another man, an Aboriginal called Dick Ruffsey, who died a few years ago. Percy and Dick were great friends and worked together making paintings and books for many years. Dick even made Percy into a blood brother and gave him an Aboriginal name, Warren By. But first, let me tell you how I got to this place. The beautiful country that I'm standing in now is right at the top of Australia. I had to travel a long way to get here, taking a big plane to Cairns and then a smaller one right into the bush where Percy was there to meet me. Welcome to Quicken Country, Kylie. You. You'll love the place, okay. for sure. First, we went to see his studio where he and Dick used to paint. set up camp. Then we drove a very long way into the bush. Ouch, look, a little quicken must have been coming through those bushes back there. Oh, they're everywhere. Dark hole in there, Kylie. Dick said the Quakers live in there, so watch it. That first uh, children's picture book we did, Gaia, the giant devil dingo. We got that from paintings around here, and Gaia goes, oh! Hello, old fellow, old Guriel, are you there still? I got a visitor for you, Kylie. Been like you, come all the way across Australia from Melbourne. I hope you look after her. Oh, Dick told me that you must always be careful to let the spirits know that you're coming when you're approaching these places, so I always call out to them. First of all, got an Im Jim Quinkin here in the dark red, and all those fish, scrub turkeys with their eggs, and uh, lots of human figures, a huge horizontal one here, another beautiful yellow scrub turkey, and then the great horse. There are hundreds of cliffs and caves, but until 20 years ago, no white people knew what was in them. Here is an Injun, a Tamara Quicken, and that's a stingray, and that's another scrub turkey. How did you ever find these paintings? Well, the road builders found the first one, uh, making the road below, and uh, it was such a rich mosaic of colour and figures that I knew there had to be a lot more. It was a vast body of art in the area, and I, being a pilot, I got aeroplanes and came flying around everywhere looking for the, for the similar places, and I found them. I kept finding all these mysterious-looking figures and quinkins. I didn't know what they were, and suddenly I realised that there were old men in Laura and that Dick would know, would be able to converse with them. Dick was the key to unlocking the mystery. He was the one that got the old men 
to tell us all the wonderful stories around the campfires at night and it was there that we promised them we'd keep these stories going by publishing them in books. They'd be available to all the children of Australia. It was exciting to sit around the campfire and listen to some of the people who'd heard these old stories. And that's how Percy and Dick found out about Gaia, the giant devil dingo, about the rainbow serpent tearing the great mountain apart, of the supernatural spirits, the Quinkins, and of course, Taramulli, the giant Quinkin, my very favourite story. Taramulli towered above the trees as he stamped about hunting for food. He would eat any large animal, kangaroo, emu, other quinkins, or people. The only sound he made as he strode rapidly after his prey was a relentless wong, 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 a sound feared by all. So how do you actually get the figures and the story together to become this book? Oh, that's easy. Uh, we decide on the story that we're going to do, one of the legends, and we take it and divide it into 14 parts, each with its own description, then we do 14 paintings. Right. So who did what? I mean, did you ever fight? No, Dick and I were great mates. We, um, uh, when I first met him, we were, he was doing bark painting and I was doing acrylics, and he wanted to do the acrylics too, and in no time, uh, he was so, so quick at learning that we were having exhibitions in Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Brisbane, all over, and uh, so we came to do the series of children's uh, picture books. So who actually did what on the... Well, um, I used to do the landscapes, probably because I was, uh, I loved them, I was a bit better at landscapes than Dick, and, and Dick used to put the figures in. He was really terrific at doing Aboriginal figures, especially action figures. Boy, when they were running, their, their knees were touching their chin, they were really going, the same with the, the birds and the animals. He, uh, he got terrific um, movement, motion into his paintings. Really fantastic. One day, Moonbi and his sister Leolin were hunting with their parents. As they hurried along, Moonbi called to his father, Warren, by, I can hear a wonk, wonk, wonk. Is it the giant Taramali? Wonk, wonk. Wonk! After the first storm of the wet season, we'd be sitting around the camp in the, the fire in the evening, and the frogs would be going, and Dick would say, Hey, Warren boy, you listen. Might be, might be Taramay, that one. Wonk! 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 And I'd say, Oh, Dick, it probably could be old, uh, the frog, you know. And he'd say, Oh, you never know when, he, when you hear that. Wonk! 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 You've got to be careful, you see. You never know the mysteries of the bush that might come. They can come, you know. When the wonk, wonk, wonk became much louder, they realised it was Taramali chasing them. Warren Bai told the children to drop everything so they could run faster. He threw the kangaroo down, saying, Taramali will stop to eat that and give us time to escape. Taramali came striding swiftly along, travelling faster than a man can run. His booming wonk, 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 echoing back from red cliffs, and the pounding of his mighty feet shaking the ground and sounding like distant thunder. We found the painting of, of Tara Mully and we, we, we knew it was a different kind of Quinkin. So we asked the old blokes and they said, oh, that'll be Tara Mully. That means thunderstorm. And he he uh, sleeps all winter in caves underneath the mountains. Mm -hmm. He just sort of hibernates. And the first storms of the wet season wake him up. The first thunder. That's why he's called Taramulli. And he, of course he's ravenously hungry when he comes out. He'll, he'll eat anything. Kangaroos, people, other quinkins. Wonk, wonk, wonk. <laughs> you don't stick around when Taramulli's coming. Just that's, run. That's why they, <laughs> they belted away because the kids knocked up and as was always customary in the Aboriginal uh, tradition was that the kids couldn't run away fast enough so you stuff them in a hollow log. The family ran on and on but Moonby and Lealan were tiring. Only the dread of being caught and eaten by the horrible Taramali kept them going. Lealan called to her father, please kill him with your spears. 
I can't run much farther. Now Taramali could be heard close behind them. The children were staggering, so their father said, Quickly, hide in that hollow log. We will run faster and draw him away. We will lose him in the dark and come back for you in the morning. Moonbi and Lialin shivered with terror as they heard the mighty tramp of Taramali coming closer and closer. The giant Quinkin was not booming wonk, wonk, wonk anymore. As he passed their hiding place, they saw he was eating the kangaroo their father had dropped. Soon the sounds of Taramali faded and darkness fell over the land. I love this one. Who did this? Oh, we both did that. Uh, I had the idea that Taramali should be full size, e eating that big kangaroo that they dropped. And, and Dick said, no, no, he said, he said, put those two big hairy legs going past the log. He said, it'll horrify the kids. It emphasises the giantness. And I said, beauty, that's just the way to do it. I think that's a great idea. It's a pretty scary story. Well, kids love to be scared. Kids love to be horrified. They like it. They're, and, uh, you know, they love the blood, and kids all over the world are like that. It's just natural. The kookaburra woke Moonby at dawn. He shook Lialan, and together they peeped out of the log. Lialan was very thirsty and said, Let's go down to the lagoon for a drink. Moonby agreed. All right, our father will see our tracks and know where we have gone. They were drinking at the lagoon, watched by curious brogas and jabaroos, when they again heard the dreadful wong, wong, wong of Taramali. Moonby said, Quickly, Alan, we must run and climb the cliff. Perhaps Taramali won't be able to get up there. The sight of Taramali towering over the trees made them run even faster. The children ran through the bush to the base of the cliff and began climbing along ledges too narrow for Taramali. They did not know they were on Quinkin Mountain, Taramali's home, and he knew an easy way to the top. Here we are. Here, after three days of camping and tramping, finally, there is Taramali. The terrible Quinkin, and he lives under Quinkin Mountain, which is not far from here, and weren't Leland and Moon be in big trouble as they climbed up on top of that mountain. What a wonderful story. Fantastic. <laughs> up on Quinkin Mountain, Moonby was helping Lialan over the last ledge when they again heard the wong, wong, wong of Taramali coming toward them across the top of the mountain. They held hands and ran, dodging Taramali in the thick bushes. The sides of Quinkin Mountain were sheer cliffs, and when Taramali was almost on them, they pushed through some low bushes and found themselves falling. Warren Bai and Nagara had tracked their children to the base of the cliff. They looked up and watched in horror as their children tumbled off the top of Quinkin Mountain. Taramali, wonking in terror now, was falling after them. Just below the top of the cliff, there was a cave. Inside it lived two Tamara Quinkins. They had shivered in fright when they heard Taramali stamping above them. Now they were peering fearfully upwards and saw the two children falling toward them. Quickly, the two Tamara reached out their long, thin arms and each caught a child, pulling them to safety. Taramali hurtled past, booming, wong, 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 as he fell towards the rocks below. Everyone was overjoyed when they found the terrible giant Taramali was gone forever from their country. Nowadays, the only wonk, wonk, wonk you can hear comes from the green frogs in the swamps. I'm glad you like that. Now, has anyone got any questions they'd like to ask Percy about the book? Yes? How did you get the pictures made into books? How are the pictures made into books? Well, we take our story and we divide it into 14 parts. And then we paint 14 pictures. There's the 14 for the next book. This is about old Bunyip. He's a Victorian Quinkin. 
And then we, I do the landscapes and Dick puts the figures in. And then we send them to the publishers in Sydney and they look at them and they decide that they might want some changes made. So they photocopy them and there's Taramulli there and they sent back there and they said, put more blood here. They wanted more blood to show that he, well, his leg was all broken. And so we make the alterations to, to the paintings and then we send them back to the publishers. And they would then look at them and say, yes, that's fine. And they'd send them off to the printers and the printers get to work with their printing presses and churn out the great big stacks of the book so that everybody gets to, to have a copy of Taramulli. Hey, look out, Corey. Quick in there. Im Jim, that one with the bounces on his tail. Boing, boing, boing. He's got stone axe on his elbow there. He might hit you with that one. It's a proper Im Jim, that one. Dangerous little fella. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, it's time for me to go home now. I've had a fascinating time here, looking and learning about these rock paintings, and especially hearing the stories they tell. You know, it would take a whole lifetime to study these paintings, and that's exactly what Dick and Percy have been doing, as you can see in their wonderful picture books. You know, there are a lot of mysterious places here. The tribal custom says that I can't go to a lot of them. But just imagine the stories. Bye. <laughs>